chapter 4 of, uh, of Luke. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge your unlimited and boundless power in us, among us, within us, around us. Both in heaven and earth, in all the universe, you rule. So this morning we come and pray and that you will talk to us through your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Father. Amen. <coughs> Presidents have power. I don't know if you have seen the movie Lincoln. And having grown up, in, grown up in the USA, I'm very much into this type of movies. Where President Lincoln says, I am the President of the United States invested with immense power. And he's meaning that he wants to get this, um, this law against slavery passed down so they can blot slavery out of the United States. But the thing is that he didn't have that much power because some states seceded from the South. And this pastor friend that I said to you that replaced me, he was an Aussie and, and he went to the U.S. and he told me his stories living in the South. And he saw how a deacon from the church, Baptist church, saw two black guys walking. And he said, if we have won the war, these chefs will be serving us still. But our dads couldn't cope with the war. So they did win the war in the north and they did, they did took out slavery. But in some people's hearts, they wish they could have slaves. Christians. Somebody else put a, uh, something on Facebook saying, oh, we should learn about this general, Presbyterian general, to be more broke. Not nobody's perfect. And he was saying, oh, this guy used to be so, so holy. He, he kept the Sabbath, meaning the Sunday. He didn't, he didn't visit anybody. He kept reading his Bible. He was praying on the Sabbath, Sunday. And I asked him, he was a general from what side? From the South. And I said, well, he was keeping the Sabbath. He was a holy man, yet he was fighting to keep slavery. What sort of Christian was he? Well, my friend didn't know that. He needed the, the post. Because he was embarrassing. So people don't have that much power. Dictators think they have power. I don't know if you saw the ABC, um, the ABC report on North Korea. Who saw it this week? You know, I'm into Korea because my, my daughter Natalie likes K-pop. <laughs> So, so I follow a lot of Korean things. Kind of, you know, some sort of uh, music from Korea. So I know everything. Well, I think I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> and she wants to marry a Korean guy. And, and there's, a, there's a United Church that has a service in Korean. And she wants me to take her there. I said, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to understand anything. But anyway. You know, in North Korea, women were not allowed to wear pants. In North Korea, it gets very cold. But women started wearing pants and started rejecting, rejecting what the dictator used to say. And two months ago, he buckled. He allowed women to, to wear pants. So they don't have total dominion. Presidents, prime ministers, dictators, they don't control the weather. You know, there's a drought. I saw Tony Abbott. We'll do something about it throw money at people. I was in the country. I know what they do. They throw money. I, I used to be in a, in a board that we used to direct $5 million to people, you know. Every, every month we used to get together and give $20,000 here, $50,000 there. But they can't control the, the sky. They can't control, they can't control the, the clouds, the rivers. But Jesus can control everything. See, Jesus' life 
sometimes looks like a contradiction because people think that, oh, he couldn't control everything, he was killed. But even in his death, he accomplished our salvation. It wasn't a mindless death. If he controlled the Sea of Galilee in Luke 8, 20, uh, 22 and, uh, and, and the rest of the chapter, he also controlled the seas. You know, he healed the lepers. And we have doctors here, so, so, they, so we know what Jesus was doing. And he also controlled death. He brought a lot of people from the dead. And he came himself from the dead. But today we will focus on something that we don't like sometimes because it gets messy. Which is exorcism. And I wonder if you have seen The Exorcist, the movie. And if you couldn't go to sleep after watching it. But you were, you were so stuck with the exorcism that you wanted to see the second movie. And there was a third movie. Exorcism is not something that we like, not something that we are used to seeing. But we'll see what happens. After the reaction, there's amazement in Jesus' ministry. See, Jesus had not only being his hometown in the in previous verses of the chapter 4, he came back to his hometown. And what did they want to do at the end of the, of the story? He says, they got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. So he came back to Nazareth, and he didn't get a uh, homecoming uh, um, party. I wonder if you want to. Are there no hills around here? <laughs> there is only the sea. Oh, the Yuyangs. Uh, yeah. Well, Peter, okay, well, the Peter's kind of. <laughs> Imagine that. So Jesus came back. He, he, he went to his town, to hometown, and they put him up. <coughs> but then he comes down to Capernaum, and, that, and, and that's where I want to. If, if Scott has the. The, the map. See, this is Galilee. That's Samaria, Galilee. And the next one. The next one has... Because the Bible says... And actually, um, Jeff was reading from the Greek, I think, because he was really... He, he was really uh, saying what the Greek was he's saying. So this is Nazareth. And the Bible says he came down. And a lot of people say, well, he came down. Well, he's going up. But the thing is that Nazareth is 1,200 feet above ground, and Capernaum is only 680. So that's what the Bible is saying. So he's very close to the sea. It's actually right in front of the sea. So now you know Chorazin, Capernaum, and that's Magdala. That's where um, Mary Magdalene comes. Cana, that's where he... Uh, that, that's where he did his first miracle, remember, in John? I'm going to talk about it later. So his, this is all, all the, the area where Jesus started his ministry. Just wanted to show that. So that's where he is. They wanted to kill him. And then he comes down to Capernaum, and, and, and on the Sabbath, as a very good Jew, he went to church. He went to the synagogue. And he began to teach people. And they were amazed at his teaching. Because his matches had authority. And you know why he had authority? Because Jews usually teach this way. Um, some rabbis say one thing. Some wise men say one, one thing. And some sages say something. So you never knew what they what they. They, they wanted to say, because they, they told you what everybody else knew, but they never told you what they told about the text. And remember uh, chapter 5 of, of uh, chapter five to 7 of Matthew, the Sermon of the Mount? How does Jesus say? You have heard, said this, this, and that, but I say to you, but I say to you, he had authority. 
He didn't rely on anybody else's scholarship or he didn't rely on anybody else's thinking. Jesus said it and that was it. He wasn't messing around. And people were amazed at his teaching. <coughs> what do you hear on Sundays here? <clears throat> do you come to church to be entertained? Do you like how the musicians play? How the, the, the preacher preaches? I was invited last weekend. I was in a uh, church conference somewhere in Werribee. And, and with the friend who invited me, she, she asked me, what do you think? We know each other from Salvadorian. She's married to an Aussie. And we know each other from 17 years old. I just came to Australia. And I, she's a nurse. And she asked me, what do you think about the, the conference? My, my answer was, it was extremely funny. I didn't, I didn't learn anything. And I didn't laugh. I was just, this guy was saying a joke every 45 minutes. Every 45 seconds. I timed him. Okay, let's see. And the people were coming out of this conference. Oh, what a great speaker. And, 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 and actually, it was so blunt. Oh, well, this was in English. I could say this in Spanish, I said, oh, he was a great clown. <laughs> and he was a better singer than, than, than a preacher. I thought he was in the wrong thing. And he, he, he said many things, and, and people were coming out saying, amazed that, that, oh, yeah, he made us feel good. If a preacher makes you feel good, he's not doing his job right. He's supposed to preach to you the word of God. And the word of God is usually against us because we all sin this year, aren't we? And if we feel, oh yes, brother, you are, you, are, you are conquering Christ. Yes, I'm a conquering Christ, but because of what he's done on the cross, not of what you tell me your story. These, these people, sometimes they come and they tell you, look at what God has done with me. You know, I have a Mercedes Benz, I have a big house, I have this big ministry. You can do it too, brother. You can do it too. Trust in God and you, you achieve this. <coughs> and it sounds more like an Amway conference than a Christian conference. <coughs> I'm sorry, and I wish I could stand up. I'm sorry, brother. I don't like to manipulate people. I don't like to make people believe that they can do whatever they can because some people have better skills than others. I don't want to preach that I can be a great um, carpenter because I can't. That would be lying. That's not going to be preaching. That's going to be lying. And lying to your face. So if a preacher comes to your church and he doesn't preach the word of God, and, I, and I'd said this to my friend, he's giving you a pep talk. He's not preaching. He's not preaching. He's, and these people, they only preach about themselves, how much they have achieved. Uh, you, you have to say it, brother, and it will become true. And you know, um, I know some of those people recently that's been put in jail. And I said, well, and, and I pick on them. Well, let them now confess that they're not in jail. Let, them, let, let their faith work. Let it show that they have this power that they say they have. But they don't. If I don't work, I don't eat. Not that if I confess, Lord, give me this thing. Some God is merciful. God provides. It's not you manipulating God. It's not you manipulating uh, reality. We do things in God's authority, not ours. If God wills, this shall be done. It's not so much you want it. It's if God wants it for you. So the teaching, this teaching is not going to go down well in that type of churches. Because God, I'm your son, and I demand. Imagine my daughter comes to me like that. Oh, I said, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Last time they demanded a PS4. <laughs> and I said, well, I first have to find a job. <laughs> And then I may consider buying you a PS4. And if we as parents are like that with our children, how much our Heavenly Father? You don't 
need a PS4 now, Louis. You need a job. So people are amazed that they've been told scripture. Why? Because people are amazed when scripture is being preached today. Instead of rejoicing sometimes, well, you're amazed. Wow, I never heard this guy preach Jesus. I only hear about the pastor's life, about how, how good God is with him, with his family, how, how great this ministry is spreading out. Oh, God must be blessing this church because it's going up, it's going places. We see more people being employed in this church. And it's true, sometimes it's good, it's good, and I guess that. But we'll see what happens when it, what happens when there's a church that the gospel isn't preached. It's not only material. If you want to place yourself in material things, if the church is only called to, to, to aim for material uh, gain, then you lost the plot, my brothers and sisters. Number two, then. Jesus' power at work. This is what happens when Jesus is at work in a church. It's not so much how many people come to church, which is also an outcome, but let's see. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, an unclean spirit. How does the Bible, Jeff, your say? Uh, 33. An unclean or? Impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. See, God's power is not only concentrated in the teaching. And this is where a lot of people get, But I don't like this. God's power is also, can also be seen in people's lives. And one way is exorcism. Ooh, you don't like it. You remember how in the exorcist, blah, how they feel? And there's a movement in Latin America, and I, and I think also in some English-speaking churches, that when people are called to, to the altar to be prayer upon, you must throw up. In Latin America, this and it's just from my country, okay, but she's big, big, big. It's just, it's just, just, just so famous. And she asked people, "Did you bring your bags today?" And everybody, yeah. So and then, okay, let let, let us be delivered. Blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I asked this question, and actually, my video became a bit famous because those just yes, because of this question. I did a video criticizing them. <laughs> well, if you throw up and that's supposed to get the devil out because you're throwing something out of your stomach because they say that they live there I don't know how they take a picture or some x-ray I don't know <laughs> how come can it go the other way too? <laughs> that was my question if you need to get the devil out of your system it has to come out <laughs> And they said, no, no, you, you, you just don't believe in God's power. <laughs> no, I believe in God's power. I believe what the Bible says. But I don't go doing this crazy doctrine. Oh, she also says that, that uh, if you throw um, salt, if you, if, if you don't want, if you don't want to, um, your, your husband to be unfaithful to you, which is a very big problem in Latin America, and you just put some salt on your on your husband's underpants. <laughs> because of some Old Testament thing there. So this, we, all these people come up with, and where's, where's that in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? And people believe it? That's the thing. Where's God's authority on that? Oh, but she says it. Well, I don't care who says it. We believe in a God of power. Paul makes mention in his letters, that the gospel is not a gospel of words. It's a gospel of power as well. And you can see that in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 40. Ah, verse 40, no, no, there was 4. He <laughs> says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, 
but on God's power. And again, he says that in 420, he says, he says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So show me the money. <laughs> you say, God is powerful? I was talking to this, this um, the pastor in the church, and we came to, uh, to the, where I'm going. Well, he's, 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 he comes once a month because he has another church on the other side of the city. And we came, and, and you understand this, palliative prayer. Palliative prayer, which means you pray to make people feel good, but you don't really believe that something's going to happen. I, I, I came up with this thing. I said, yeah, palliative prayer. Yeah, it's true, because you pray, God will heal you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're okay. You're going to die soon. But when we pray, we are supposed to believe what we pray. If we're going to believe, I'm going to pray for this person who's going to get healed, yes, he's going to get healed. And your mind has to trust Jesus. You don't know what God is thinking. Because some people say, oh, we don't know the will of God. That's why we, we can't ask for, 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 for this. Well, God, the will of God is to go and preach the gospel to every creature, to heal the sick, to do ministry. That, that's God's will. We know it. We don't know. We don't specifically know if God's going to take this person or not. I don't know, but I'm going to do what the Bible says. So the, so the gospel is power. And then we have all these gifts given to us in Romans 12, 5 to 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, Ephesians 4, 10 to 11. And what, what are those gifts here in this church? Are we a Bible believing church or we say, well, oh, those, that's, that's the Christians in the past. You know, this is this is Australia now. We don't need healing. We have Medicare. <laughs> well, we have it. Let's enjoy what we have. It. <laughs> so, Mark, Mark 16, 17, and 18, which is a disputed text. I, I, I'm going to lead to that. Um, um, I don't know if you know John MacArthur, he, he says, oh, you can't believe that because it's not in the real, it's not in the Greek, but if you open with Mark 16, 17, verse, uh, verse 17, well, let's go to 15 then. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. So we don't have to ask God for that. We know. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So, if we don't believe this type of doctrine, because you know some people are so close-minded that if you don't believe certain doctrine, you're not saved. Well, I don't know. And these signs will accompany, accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. And some people say, no, that's, that's, not, that's not in the original. But we see it in Acts. People doing it. That's why in God's wisdom, they left the dead. They were speaking new tongues. This is up to you if you believe this. I mean, I respect. I personally speak in tongues. I don't have an issue with that. And I spoke in tongues in a reformed church. So it was almost like being possessed by the devil. <laughs> they were praying for me. They were praying for God to come upon me. And I started speaking in tongues. And people went, what was happening? I said, and the thing is that I couldn't, I couldn't answer back because I spoke in tongues for like one hour. And I was asking, where's my Bible? And my cousin said, what are you talking about? Where's my Bible? And, and my man, I'm a man, I was asking for my Bible, but I don't understand anything. So if you're having a hard time understanding me, <laughs> I'm not speaking in tongues, don't worry. <laughs> but that's me. I respect those who don't believe in that, who don't do it. I don't believe that you must do it. Because some people say, if you are not, you don't speak in tongues, you are not saved. Well, the Bible doesn't say that, so then again, you're wrong. <laughs> Pick up snakes with their hands. We see Paul doing it. We didn't, saw, we didn't see Paul in every service with a snake, you know? Look how, 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 what a good snake handler I am. I think he's in heaven, but he, this guy is going to find out. And it's very interesting that only in Appalachia, Right in, the, in right that part of the United States, people come up with all these ideas. I come from over there, so I can speak. 
They will pick up snakes with the hands and they, they drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them at all. I don't know about this one. And then I, didn't, I don't see it in the Bible. But I don't know if you believe that Putin was a, was a believer. He, he drank poison. He didn't die. <laughs> Rasputin, you know, the, the guy from the from Anastasia, from the movie from the Russian Revolution they will place their hands on sick people and they will get maybe they will get well that's not what the Bible is saying they will place their hands on people and maybe possibly will get well no, the Bible says they will get well and we see that again in Acts so Jesus comes and he delivers these people. And he and, and, the, and the spirit wants to control Jesus. You know, he says, Oh, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And you only find that expression here in Luke and in Mark. Mark 1, 21 to 28. That's the only time you find the expression Holy One of God in the Bible. Those two. And then Jesus says, Jesus doesn't doesn't start uh, doesn't start talking to the to the, um, to the demon, like I saw once, a friend, when I was 14, a friend of mine started talking to the demon-possessed person. I said, oh, so where do you come from? Oh, I'm a demon from many, many ages ago, from China. <laughs> and, I, and then they got so tired of talking. Because they were talking, I said, hey, we have to get this demon out. <laughs> I was like 14, and these people were 25, 40 years old. And, and then the guy said, oh, I'm hungry, let's go eat. And then the demon possessed person said, oh, I'm hungry too. Let's go to McDonald's. <laughs> so a demon, you know, the, you're not supposed to do that. Jesus came and he says, be quiet. Come out of you. That's what he said. Then the demon threw the men down before them all and came out without injuring him. Do you want to see demon possessed people in your church. No, 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 please don't. Don't tell me that. Because if that happens, it's a sign that God is here. Believe it or not. And you may see somebody, oh yeah, but that's my dear brother, my dear sister, we've been to church all our lives and suddenly she's convulsing, ah! throwing up or whatever. But God is doing something in their lives. Sometimes we think we're such a good church, you know, we're a decent church. You know, we raise, we come down, we sing, we have good music. Do we have a very good time afterwards, sharing with one another? But that was it. And what about the deliverance? What did Jesus say in chapter 4, verse 18? Let's, let us read. What did Jesus say? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I want to be released from my bondage. Do you want to be released from your bondage, brother and sister? You don't have to say which, what sort of bondage it is. But do you want to be released? Do you believe that God can release you? Do you? And sometimes it's not nice. In this passage, it's not nice because you see things that you're not used to. I'm not used to. Yet God is offering release from bondage. Some people have this thing in their hearts for 40, 50 years. One lady told me, I hated this person for 60 years and I can't forgive them. And I remember in the Lion King too, there's a song that says, I cannot forgive what I cannot forget. My dear brother and sister, this morning we need deliverance. And Jesus is here to do it. You don't, you don't have to go all like that. And, no, no. But God can do it in you. 
this this is what happens when people are released from from um, from demons. You don't have to convulse or anything. If you come with me to chapter 19 of Acts. Yes, and you can put it here. I don't know if you've done it already. Chapter 19 of Acts, 17 to 20. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a very... Um, it's a very um, interesting for 13. He says, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish high priest, chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And actually, I saw this once. And it was embarrassing. Because this guy, he was supposed to be being possessed. And, then, and I knew him. And I knew that he didn't know karate. And then suddenly he started going, Wah! and then and he beat up two of the people who were trying to release but then 17, 17 and 20 are very important verses. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was, was held in high honor. Many of those who believed, these are not unbelievers, these are believers. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. So these are Christians who have these things inside them, who, have, who are now walking right with the Lord. And then suddenly when they see the power of God, when they see that Jesus there has power, they come and confess their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, which in today's money is 42 and a half million dollars. Sin is very expensive. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Sin costs, my brothers and sisters. Sin is costly. But the gift of God is free. The Bible says in 1 John 1 9 says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us, give us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the gospel. That Jesus can forgive us. That Jesus has power to forgive our sins. Only He does. Not the priest, not the pastor, not the deacon, not the elder, not your parents. Jesus is the one with power. And then, in 1 John 2, 1, 2 says this, and these are these beautiful words. Beautiful words. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if, you, if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father of our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if you have sin in your life, I have seen in my life, Jesus has the power to restore you. Do you, you want a church like that? Do we want a church like that? That people come and say, wow, in that place, people are delivered. Wow, in that place, people with problems are restored. So what are we responsible to it? The response of the people, to finish up, are all the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. But sometimes, amazement is sometimes not enough 
they went to meet it. Did Jesus get it? Some people go to these tent revivals or whatever you want to call them, and you see some miracles, but to come out of them, and that was it. But what we want to see is something that happens that will last, that will make you walk with the Lord, that will make you have a holy life. That's the gist to grow. Walk with Jesus every day. When drug addicts come and they need some treatment. Yes, some of them need some treatment. Uh, I was going to say ethanol. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not that. What do they drink? Uh, I had a friend who has to drink something every so often. So, methadone. methadone, yes. Thank you. But some people, when you pray, they suddenly are released. How God works, He works both ways. He, go, he works through doctors, through law, through whatever, but sometimes He wants to do it not through any means, but directly. So let God be God, and we just receive His blessings. So what do we, the, what do people know Altona for? What do people know Altona for? Oh, it's the church behind calls. No, it's the church uh, right beside the library. Or we, or do we want people to know Altona is the place where sinners go and get Jesus. It's the place where sinners go and they're restored. It's the place where, where uh, marriages get restored, where people who are drug addicts get restored. It's the place where my kids can get um, Christian values. It's the place where we can hear the word of God preach, not only entertain. How do we want Altona to be known? Are we impacting our community? And this thing has, since I came back to Melbourne, I've been thinking a lot about this. How am I going to impact my surroundings? And you know, the first thing I did was to introduce myself to my neighbor. And I told him right away that I'm a Christian. Why? Because that commits me to live a Christian life beside my neighbor. If he doesn't know me Christian, I can do whatever I want. But if I said right away, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I live under Jesus' authority. I don't live under my own whims. Then people are going to expect something from you. In conclusion, in John we see Jesus starting his ministry by changing water into wine to, to show that he's the promised Messiah. In Luke and Mark, the same thing. Jesus starts his ministry by delivering a demon-possessed man. In both instances, Jesus is bringing freedom and joy to those who are receiving these miracles. And he confirms who Jesus is. Now, we are called to preach to all nations. And we, we read what's expected to happen when we preach to all nations. Is that confirming who we are? And we are under, under Jesus' authority. And to finish, let us read Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to the end. And this is Jesus speaking before going to heaven. Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been, been given to me. So, you have no issues. You are doing, you are preaching, you are doing, you are under God's, under Jesus' authority. Therefore, go and make disciples to all, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to you to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Brothers and sisters, our authority goes 
beyond any government authority. Every three years here in Australia, they change. Or every four or five years in states. Well, whoever goes into the government knows that they only have three years to make changes. Well, we have to the end of the age to change our community.